from Los Angeles, California. Welcome to CG Society. I'm your host, Travis Forbeau, and today we're speaking with David Levy, art director, concept artist, and studio head. Today's topic will be portfolios, and I think to begin, the best thing to do, David, would be to start off with your industry experience. Uh, sure. <clears throat> so I have been in the entertainment industry slash uh, say design industry for around uh, 25 years now. Uh, I started in the video game industry, in which I stayed for 15 years, and then uh, uh, I moved to the movie uh, industry, uh, which was uh, 10 years ago when I moved to Los Angeles. And now I moved out of Los Angeles. Uh, I now live in North Carolina uh, and I created a studio uh, called Pitch Dev Studios. And when it comes to studying, I studied uh, industrial design and uh, interior architecture. So the topic is portfolios, but moving out to North Carolina is an industry tidbit. Um, you have moved kind of at the height of, of your concept art, art direction career. Um, was that something scary for you uh, to, head, to head out of Los Angeles? Or, or what is the environment like now for the ability to do that? Uh, so uh, as you may expect, I mean, it was a terrifying move, even uh, when you're uh, kind of when you're established in the industry, uh, it's a very scary move because people usually are really used to have you here in a studio. But at the same time, you know, uh, so the, and there's also the thing that as an artist, you always have like a low self-esteem, whatever uh, level of professionalism you are, uh, and you have to fight that uh, one way or another. Uh, also, it's a financial. Uh, planning that is involved in moving your whole family to a different state and uh, so it's it's not easy uh, but also what makes what made me a little more comfortable is the fact that I see so many young kids online now that do that you know they live in uh, everywhere in the world you know and um, they're most of them are doing fine you know so I thought you know what if I move to a state where life is cheaper uh, even if I just start with a tiny jobs you know i don't care you know i'll be happy anyway what makes me happy now is different than what made me happy uh, 10 years ago 15 years ago so and, and you mentioned the fact that you've been doing this for 25 years and you know five years ago i would have said that you need 25 years experience to be able to pull that off but you brought up a good point which is that you know a lot of younger artists with a lot less time in industry are able to build these bridges today. And that's kind of why we're taking a look at portfolios in, in some sort is that online is such a marketplace right now for contacts and, and bridge building in a way that I don't think existed for us in this capacity when we started 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, you've also gone through different positions in the industry as you mentioned not just film and games but you've uh, moved through being a concept artist to an art director to directing your own private gigs and now a studio head um, that kind of plays into one of the things that i wanted to discuss today which is having a portfolio that fits the time in your career that you're at um, different levels of art or different things that you're going to show or highlight we can get into that as we discuss portfolios at the end of today for viewers we'll be going through the gallery and david will be picking intermediate advanced and, and professional level art to kind of talk about how to um give yourself an advantage so to speak to get that that, that attention in the right way um david do you want to go through some of your art and kind of talk about where your art's at now and how it might have been different um in your portfolio prior to today and the things that you're showing today for your studio and for your personal work. Uh, do you want to give us some examples of stuff you've done? Uh, sure. I, uh, do you see my uh, CG Society gallery yet or not? We do. Does okay, everybody cool. else see that? Yeah, you see it. It should be fine. Yeah. Uh, and the main thing I would say, I mean, if, I, if there is one advice that I would say people could come out of uh, this uh, talk with, uh, is uh, I only show at times on my portfolio the stuff that I want to do. And usually, because your portfolio is the window, of, your window of who you are, you know. So if you put stuff, that only stuff that you've done in your work environment, 
and you're okay with what you've done in your work environment, but that's not what you like, you will get hired for the same stuff. So I've changed over the years in terms of style, in terms of uh, in terms of what I like to do, and because as an artist, I change. I'm not someone, I mean, a lot of artists may enjoy the fact that they do one style for the rest of their life, and that's okay, you know. But what I found out for myself is that after 10 years in a field or five years in the field or 10 years, sometimes I just get tired and I want something else, you know. And then I may go back to the stuff I love uh, that are different at times, you know. But I would say that the best advice I can say is show the stuff you, li you like to do. So I would say, uh, uh, for example, uh, for example, the Trump stuff, you know, is uh, is 10 years ago, you know. And it's something that I do leave in my portfolio because it's probably been the most, it's, I mean, the most fun job I've ever had, you know. Uh, and uh, in terms of technique, you know, uh, I've, I mean, it was much more into painting at the time, but it's still something that I enjoy doing. So if I'm being hired to do that kind of work, uh, I'm cool with it, you know. So, so these kind of images, I still enjoy doing, you know. Uh, it's stuff that I will always love doing. I love sci-fi, you know, the reason why I'm in this industry is because I love sci-fi. And any project that I'm being asked to do, if it's sci-fi, I will love it, you know. I it touches things that, I, that I've that i always loved, you know, like architecture, I, said, I mean, I studied in architecture a long time ago, I studied in industrial design. And I mean, even I think in 10 years from now, when I'm old and decrepit and I can barely move, I will still love doing sci-fi. You know, uh, so I mean, and these are sometimes it's even just paint overs of uh, of uh, rough frames. This is like pure speed painting stuff, you know. Uh, let me go back and find other ones. And I also think this is sometimes where we get in trouble because at this point you were doing Tron work. Tron is what? How how old is Tron now? The the release of Tron. Um, uh, it's it's ten years ago now. Ten years ago, but you were working on this in two thousand and five, two thousand six, maybe or two thousand seven, right around there. That was ten years ago. Yeah. So you know, with a with a junior artist, we have people all the time that you know either have just recently started work or looking for work. Um, and my advice is always, you know, anything that's beyond a year old as a student, just drop off your portfolio. Um, uh, I think it's a tricky one. I, it's tricky, right? I personally wouldn't agree. Uh, Good. I, <laughs> that's no, what we need. No. We need disagreement on things so we can get clearer no, ideas. The, the thing is that fads come and go, you know, uh, and there are certain styles, certain uh, type of work that I think you should have. If you see like a massive uh, kind of... Uh, inspiration that goes uh, all through the industry. I think it's good to stay up to that game because technically and visually, it's something that studios, not everybody is a creator in the studio, you know? And when they see something, they like it, they contact the, the artist, but the artist is not available, they may fall back on someone else, like maybe you, you know? And at that point, if you have something that's ready for that, I think it's both of both world. You have to have the latest look type thing Right. And you also have to have the stuff that you love because you will always be hired for the stuff that you love because when you love something, it shows, you know? Right. And having, having personal, personal hobbies, personal influences, I think that's very important. That's one of the things that's difficult these days in looking at a lot of portfolios is that we do see a lot of academic work in portfolios and, and sometimes not enough personal life experience or personal influence in your art. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that's something that I look for a lot, uh, but then I tend to be somebody uh, that does a lot of outside of art as well. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. And, and the things that as an artist, the things that inspire you will always be kind of based on your personality. You know, I grew up uh, sailing when I was a kid, you know, and I can't hide the fact that I will always love doing that kind of stuff. For some reason, I'm trying to click on the image. It doesn't load. Do you know why that happens? Can you hear me? <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, you could you probably just log out and go to the top where it says David Levy and log out because that's going to give you your.
private view of your gallery. Uh, right. So if you log out, then you can look at it as a spectator and it, it won't give you any issues on clicking things. Oh, For those of you that are here today, we're updating oh, our platform. Yeah, cool. Um, and that's going to be here coming a couple months right now. There's some frustrating errors with it that we've been working on for the past few years and getting rid of those. So bear with us on that. Uh, you don't have to log back in. You can just look at your, your stuff. Yeah, that's cool. So, so yeah, so this kind of stuff, I mean, remind me of when I was a kid and I would always paint them forever. And regularly now, I, I am asked to do jobs uh, for that kind of stuff. You know, I've been asked to do a job for just yesterday. I was contacted to do a, uh, some kind of uh, uh, industrial design airplane type stuff, you know, uh, and this kind of stuff really always make me happy, you know. So I want to show that stuff, even if for some it may look like, oh, it's just a sailboat or whatever. I don't care. I, that's what I love to do. And yeah. I think as I get older, that's more and more what I want. I want to do what I like to do as opposed to necessarily uh, uh, what's fashionable right now, you know what I mean? Right, and how does that work differ from from concept work on film and games? When you're working on something that's going to be built physically in the real world, obviously you've done that on film, on Tron, and others with doing some stuff for set. But is there a difference in experience in building an actual boat or doing concept for an actual boat? Uh, I would say because the movies are more uh, fast paced, you know, and then the movie's short and that's it. I would say that in terms of technicality, it's probably much easier to design uh, an asset for a movie. Uh, than it is to design an asset for real life, you know. Uh, uh, designing an asset for uh, for for uh, for real life, it's a whole different ball game, you know. Technically, it has to work under different stresses and different different reality, you know. But on a movie, you just, once you have your shot, you have your shot, and that's okay. You can move on, you know. You don't even need the truck to keep driving, you know. And if, if you're going to work on film, is, is showing that you understand how to build something in the real world or getting to the point of function, showing that function somewhere in the portfolio, is there benefit to that? For sure. I think that uh, if you can show through your work, especially for, I mean, not I mean, for any kind of industry, especially when you do sci-fi, you know, that added touch of realism is going to make a huge difference consciously or unconsciously to the viewer's eye, you know. Right. If uh, you do a spaceship, you know, and you have a base of it, if you're curious about how boats work, for example, or yachts work, I mean, if you are a good observer, that kind of detail is going to show up in your spaceship design. And this kind of stuff are going to make it unique and also look like it can function, you know, which is always a plus, I think, when you when you design stuff. So. Um, if I'm speaking to a director and they're looking for a character designer, they're looking for a prop designer, um, typically they don't want to get in touch with that artist to to speak with them until they know they want to bring them on or they, they've had the ability to see their thought process. And when you have these variations like you have with this chair, even at your level, being as, as strong and, and having the, the record and the credits that you have, um, just seeing those iterations allows me to take a look into your design process or, or your ideas, right? Um, is that something that, why do you think we don't see as much of that as we used to? And, and I, I'm saying this from a personal perspective because I literally every night go through CG Society and, and most of the forum galleries and, and go through every entry and try to keep an eye on who's coming up, what are they doing, um, who's got interesting ideas, who's able to render better than the other guy. Um, I've, I've got a lot of little categories I'm looking to fill, but in a daily search, I realize that iterations can be boring, but I find very few artists that are putting those out there uh, and, and showing that side uh, of their thought process in their portfolio. Why do you think that is? Do you think that's a need still? Or is that just a technique from days gone by to, to a younger artist? Uh, I think there's different reasons. I mean, there may be a part of insecurity you know, of saying, well, I'm not going to show something unfinished because some people might react negatively to it, which is true. I mean, some some other directors don't have the imagination you know, necessarily the level of understanding what uh, a work in progress is. And I would say they're not necessarily interested in working with those people. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, every project that I've, I mean, for the last 10 years, I, I mean, to this day, I'm still working mostly on movie movie stuff, you know, right. stuff that are going to be built, or or now I work, I'm starting working on an animation movie. But even then, 
there is no way in hell that after two days of work, I would show one iteration of a design ever. Right. right. That Those has are never happened. I mean, I after two days of work, there's I would most probably show at least five iterations of one design, and it's because time is money. You know, right. if you are giving the most options to an art director or a production designer he's going to be able to decide, or the director himself, he's going to be able to decide more precisely what he likes. You know, if you're showing just one iteration, I mean, and you say, well, that's it. That's the design. <laughs> There's a lot of chances you're not going to have a job again. You know? <laughs> you know, and can, you switch, can you switch to the other chair? I think you have one or two other versions of this one, correct? Uh, pr probably. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if they're in this. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, they are there. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Good job, Travis. Travis helped me putting that. <laughs> I'm good for that one. together. So yeah, so these are different variations, you know. And what's great is that, for example, uh, these were really early roughs, you know. Right. And from that, uh, Daniel Simon came up with his own amazing fit. You know, Daniel Simon is is just an incredible artist. You know, he's able to do technical stuff in the most beautiful way possible. But uh, he was able to pick and choose the stuff he liked, you know, what his vision is of what the seat should be. And there are elements that the portion designer liked, the elements that Daniel liked, you know, and it's just a mix and match of everybody's ideas until it comes up to the final design, uh, which is approved by a director. So I'd say the more iteration, and the thing is that there's an exercise as well when you do those iterations, which is exactly like building a a muscle, you know, if you go to the right. gym every day, you're building a specific muscle. If you just work on your legs, I mean, you're going to look like a deformed. I don't do, I don't <laughs> go to the gym, by the way, you know. But if you just work on your legs, you're going to end up just looking like a giant uh, frog, you know, <laughs> big, big legs, more upper body, you know. So I would highly not advise that. You know? So when it comes to designing, it's exactly the same thing. You know, people, there's one muscle that people practice all the time, it's the illustration muscle, because right. that's what makes you. That's what makes your image look good, whatever. But in the end, a, a design is going to be approved because the design makes sense. Right. You know? And the illustration is just a tool to sell the design. Right. And the illustration should never be primordial or only the reason why you're showing a design. The illustration is just like uh, kind of a, a smooth, it's like putting butter and pasta. You know, it's like it's the way that it's going to be much more delicious or, or like easier to eat, you know. Yeah, I, I love I love the analogy of using your legs. And, and, and it's good to get on this talking point. I didn't expect to get on this talking point, but it is good to talk about this talking point. There's two topics, I think, that, that tangent from that. One is is my first impression of costume design. Um, I remember in 2000 or Back, way back in the early 2000s, getting the Lord of the Rings books and seeing all the costume designs in there and wondering, like, these just don't look like the illustrations I see online. Like, they, they look like they're really easy. They look like they're really quick. And, and, you know, the artist doesn't seem that strong because I was ignorant, right? And then I recall Justin Sweet introducing me to two of the costume designers from Narnia. And I took a look at their book, and it was a brother and sister team. And they really made me understand in a way that made me want to smack myself in the head for being judgmental. Because the way they broke it down was, look, you know, as a costume designer, if we show this to a director, director sees a, a quick sketch, they see a quick drawing, they're not afraid at all to be able to jump in and, and make decisions to change things. And you bring them a highly polished illustration, you bring them something in 3D, you know, they're afraid you've already spent a ton of money, they're afraid to tell you they don't like it. Um, you know, that's, that's one side of the ugly versus the pretty. And, and the other side of the ugly versus the pretty, I think, is... I, I believe, you know, way back on a project a long time ago, you're familiar with, um, there were two teams, one team working on good guys concept and one team working on bad guys concept. The team that was working on good guys uh, was the weaker team, but would illustrate the hell out of everything. And our team would illust uh, go through and just iterate the hell out of everything. So, you know, everything that we're doing looks like the image I'm looking at in front of me right now or even looser. Uh, everything the other team was doing was high end. And I asked one of our artists to go ahead and render the hell out of something. He's like, if we do that, we're going to get yelled at because we're spending too much money. We're spending too much time because we make more than the other team. 
And my reply was, if we don't do that, then they're going to get the marketing art. They're going to get the illustrative art, the box cover art, and we need at least one piece to show that. So I think that's one of the reasons I want to do these kind of pro select or portfolio reviews with you know professionals and friends like yourself is because there's so much contradictory advice that's all correct when it comes to portfolios, depending on the studio, depending on the artist, depending on the director, depending on the situation. Um, and I'm fully totally expecting people to disagree on things. Yeah, and once again, that goes back to the original thing, which is do what you love, you know? And right. if you do what you love, you will find a team that you love and that loves you back. You know what I mean? I think so, it's great advice. I mean, we you do we do this that work for, I mean, sometimes 12 hours a day. You know, it happens you know, for some of us. And if you do that for 12 hours, you better like it. Let me think. Uh, yeah, I would, I would talk about that because I think it's an important part of nowadays is that the evolution of concept art. You know, uh, my portfolio has a lot of paintings, uh, but nowadays I get hired as much for painting as I get hired to do 3D renders. Uh, and not everybody is interested, but when you do uh, design, like industrial design, I think nowadays it's a must. You know, doing just 2D is only going to get you some jobs. But if you go 3D, it will get you way more jobs than if you were just doing uh, 2D. So that would be an advice. If you're into the hard surface industrial design, I say 3D is a must nowadays. I it's think that's unavoidable. I think that's, yeah. Um, I'm very happy you made that point because I have my own opinion from the group of artists and the, and the group of studios I work with. And these days, I would say for the past two years, the amazing 2D artists that will only do 2D or only have experience doing 2D are no longer artists that I can even really refer anymore. And that, that makes me sad. Um, about two years ago, I think we're the last two 2D only artists that I was able to refer, refer for a project. Because a lot of, the, as we know, a lot of the vendor studios, they don't really care about the artists that much. They're getting a job done. And for them, if they put a 2D drawing in front of a client that expects 3D and has come to them for only 3D um, or highly polished key shot renders, uh, it just doesn't float anymore. And, and it, to some extent, it's a little scary. 2D artists are never going to disappear or go anywhere. There's always the need. Um, but it does mean that so much of the amazing 2D artists are spending so much more of their time in 3D these days. Uh, and I don't know from a personal point of view how much that makes me happy. It's, it's always cool to see what people pull off in 3D for sure. Uh, yeah. and, and it can be also a mix, you know, just use a, just use a 3D as a, as a base, you know, and paint over. I mean, I mean, you can do everything now. And there's so many tutorials online, you know, that you have no excuse, <laughs> basically. It's true. Yeah. And I, actually, the thing I would say is that the best way to learn all these souls is to... Uh, is to do too much work, is to be hired on too many projects uh, <laughs> so that you have to ramp up your work. No, it's true. The I only way it. to progress, I would say, is that way. Yeah. Uh, so, and I would say there are points where you're like, okay, there's no way I can do that, that room in five different angles just through painting. Just not going to happen. Right. And the way, the only way you can use fa work fast is to use a 3D base. You know? And everybody knows that nowadays. But some people tend to forget, you know, so, yeah. that's so let's, cool. let's jump over to the gallery and, and unless there's another image you want to show, but let's jump over to the gallery. And um, so what we're looking for, everybody, this is something new, new that we're doing a few times a week is that, you know, we're not looking to put down anybody's art. We're not looking to necessarily lift anybody's art, but we want to give you the experience of what it's like for a professional, for a recruiter, for a art director to be able to come in and actually just browse through the heap of art, you know, what gets you noticed, what picks you up. And then, you know, from that perspective, we're defining this as intermediate, advanced and pro. And that's not to say that one is better than another, but what are the things that make something an intermediate work of art? Are there gaps that you need to fill still? You know, hopefully we can help you with that. You know, we can find that thing that you're missing in your image and, and push you in a direction to maybe help you if that's something that you need help with. Um, if you're advanced, uh, that means somebody that, you know, has moved from being a student and is in the first year to three years of their career and, and is a junior artist. And, you know, what does it take to push your art to the next level or, or 
um, to be using that art in more of a way that somebody in production can utilize you as, as an artist. And then, you know, professional is just art that's just really well done. It's really well presented and there's really nothing to say other than kind of good job and, and, you know, well done. So, you know, we'll do this for the first week and see how people like it and see if it's something that's helpful. But my goal is, is not to increase traffic or get people uploading more art rather going the opposite direction is refining their art and kind of thinking about how they're presenting their material and, you know, getting some kind of free help and some free criticism for those that, you know, are coming from a validated perspective. So I'm going to shut up, David. I'm going to let you go through sure. some of your picks here and just you break down for us what it is you do and don't like. And if there's something the artist can do to, to help themselves um, and what you like about it. Yeah. I mean, so first of all, I want to say that it'd be, I'd be very hard pressed to really uh, be mean to anybody because the level of artistry nowadays compared to what it was 25 years ago is just mind boggling, you know? That's true. Uh, I mean, the quality has just been going through the roof and this is thanks to uh, all the availability of uh, learning tools now that are online that allow any artist to get better if really he that's what he wants, you know. Uh, I'll say, I mean, actually, I know that guy. I've seen uh, some of his work before, and I traded with him before. Uh, I would say this is a this is a great image. Yeah, he's awesome. Really good artist. Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, there is a tendency, maybe, uh, uh, to have the image to become a little too rigid uh, in the end, and. Uh, an issue that I see with many people is the difficulty to center around uh, a very specific part of the image in order to tell a story. Uh, and this is due very often to highlights, you know, where you have highlights on some, uh, on some uh, areas that are as strong as the main subject. And I'm going to give like a really basic technique, you know, I mean, it's nothing new. But if you want an image to pop, make sure that for example, what I would do, make sure that not everything is overexposed. You know, this is overexposed. Right. And it gives a nice Control style. Contrast. Yeah, and it's okay. No, it's cool. It gives a nice style. But the issue in that is that right now, I don't know if this is more important than this. You know, And I assume it's this because the image in terms of composition follows that logic. But in terms of lighting, it doesn't necessarily follow that logic. So that's what I would say. No way I've fixed that. Just classic. Add the multiplying layer you know, with the medium tone. And then, uh, and then just uh, uh, emphasize this area being the brightest. That's and what I would do. Here. To clarify, yeah. is that what you mean by rigid when you say that the image feels a little too rigid? To you? Is it that it's it, there's no kind of eye path through to the focal point? That's that's exactly it. Okay, that's exactly it. Uh, I don't know what else? Uh, I mean, this is gorgeous. You know. Uh, I wouldn't have had much to say on this one. You know. Maybe the scale of the light, you know, maybe a little too big for the distance. You know. If this is the size, it, when it recedes into perspective, this would be much smaller. Yeah, it really depends on the project, you know, for sure. You know. I mean, I can look at other images of Thomas. Uh, I guess it's funny because I picked uh, two French guys. Uh, the, <laughs> no bias I should, there. Uh, I should go with other people. <laughs> I mean, this is a great image. You no, know, it's obviously inspired by class classical painters. I mean, this is, I have nothing to say for an image like that, to be honest. You know, that's kind of stuff that I love. You know, speed, speedy, but uh, at the same time, like proper detail and proper areas. I mean, this is great stuff, you know. Now, uh, and just to hold you there for one second, when you say that's an image you love, um, yeah. I think that is important because how much is the impact of, I just like this, I just think it's a really cool image versus if I look at this, this fits into concept hat or, or this fits in, you know, if you look at this image, how do you, where do you visualize this image fitting? And is this a game concept? Is this a film? Uh, what, what, what purpose does this image serve? Cause I love it as well, but I want, yeah, I'd like to define because, that. I mean, because of the format, right? I would say this could be a book cover. You know, if you look at someone in the, book industry, they look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's perfect. You know, I can put a title, they can put like like the code, the code bar uh, at the bottom, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, this could be a great book cover, for example, you know. Okay. Uh, but if you crop it into a, a two, three, five, you know, you could say this is like a very, very acceptable uh, in terms of quality shot for a movie. You know, this could be a perfect keyframe art, you know, that'd be okay. awesome. 
Mm-hmm. And these first three we've looked at, would you say these are all pro, these are advanced, or these are intermediate, so that we know where to kind of uh, put these afterwards? Or I, I say these are pros. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Definitely professional level. Uh, when it comes to uh, something that's more intermediate, uh, let's, look at, let's look at this. This feels maybe intermediate. And I hope I'm not insulting anybody when I say that, you know. No, and, uh, and you know, when we're putting this out, you know, I'll verify too with each individual artist and let them know that they've been critiqued and, and send this over yeah. to them. I think that people will be very glad that professionals like yourself are reaching back and, and giving a hand to help up. That's really cool. So I would say this one is definitely more intermediate, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason is, is that uh, there's uh, some values, uh, values issues, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the depth, you know, how once again it recedes into into space, you know. There, it seems that there's areas with a lot of dust. Uh, if the, there was areas with a lot of dust, you know, you would definitely have like stuff like that that'd be more diffused. More right? the light. All this would be more diffused. Yeah, everything is super sharp. You know, right. uh, which indicates that there will be very little atmosphere, but there is a lot of atmosphere. So there's kind of an opposition happening. Also, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, composition, uh, well, I'm going to go back to composition after. But in terms of receding into space, you see this object. Right. It is very hard for me to tell if it's a big object that's far or a small small object that's close. I assume it's a small object that's close, you know, but I'm not sure where it stands when it comes to depth, you know, and that's like number one worry, you know, when you're working on an image is making sure that it's super readable. Also, the scale of the thing, I mean, it's so massive that I would want some kind of indication as well of if this is so dusty, you know, what I would do right away, I would add like a slight, uh, fog or a slight uh, dust uh, cloud you know, that perked up, you know, just so that we feel, oh, wow, okay, this is big. But because this is at the same contrast level as this, or this, you know? And I, I want to I clarify that for viewers, too, just so they yeah. don't miss some of the important things you're saying, you know? One of the things that we notice a lot is that, you know, as things are, are a lot bigger, they tend to have a lot lower contrast. So, you know, a good cheat is, you know, if we want to make something look really big, then kill and knock back all that detail. Uh, yeah. And and it's it's funny that you pick up on the the floating drone that's on the left um, because I it, it occurred to me only when you pointed it out. Um, so so you know, and this is the thing. This is why I yeah. want to do it is because yeah. a lot of times with art, it's just borrowing the eyes of somebody who has more mileage than you. And as soon as they point to that thing, like look right there, it is. Like you don't just yeah. get better at this piece, but you get better at every piece and, and you know, kind of advance three months and in your own, you know, growth, so to speak. So I think that's a huge Yeah, I'm very thing. tempted to paint on this, but I don't have the time. I almost, <laughs> I look for the shot. But I just, I mean, it's so tempting, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, what I would do is like, I would paint a cloud of dust here, you know, just right. so that we push all that back. Then I would add a rock here, add one of those guys here in the foreground, so that we have a good idea of how f- much the perspective is receding. Uh, I would fog that out and make the light diffuse here. I would kill that, uh, that big hole in the sky because it makes me, it's telling me that something is about to appear, you it's know? Too powerful. Uh, it's too powerful. And it's like a circle almost, which is a very strong visual statement. I would either transform that into a circle, like a sun, or just kill it off and make it a horizon so that we see another level of mountains in the back. That's what I would do. Okay. I mean, it's a great image though. But oh, that's amazing it's feedback. Like, Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's close to being, it's close, it's very close to being professional, but I think there's a few uh, value adjustments. And that's exactly what we're looking for is like, how do you get to that next level? So that's exactly yeah. what you just did. So let's take a look at one that you feel is intermediate and that needs a little bit of help. And right. uh, let's get you out of here after that. I mean, you see that study, uh, I think it's great, you know. Uh, and the thing is that if uh, you want to have that level of depth and stuff like that, into an image like that, I'd say use references more. You know, maybe right. you can find like a like an Iceland reference, you know, and that may help you as a crutch at first, you know, to to do proper level of depth, you know, yeah, because the level that's of at observation in there is great, you know. Yeah. The kind of stuff I would avoid uh, in uh, this is the kind of stuff I would avoid in. Uh, 
in uh, in the portfolio because it's very unclear to me. It says Tom Trooper redesign. It's very unclear to me if uh, it is an illustration, a rough sketch, a design, because I would say the emphasis is done on the environment, like three quarter of the image is the environment, more than the design itself. And I understand what they did. Now they apply a 3D filter to the to the suit of a stormtrooper, but still, I'd say uh, it, it needs some more work. I wouldn't have put it in my portfolio if it was me personally. Okay, I would have worked it like another day on it or something. And can you stay on this page for yeah. one second? Because this is gorgeous, you know. Yeah, that's Sorry. that's important. Is you know, I think more often than not, people are asking what to put in their portfolio, but I think about ninety five percent of the time, it's usually you know. Your best piece is, is always fairly obvious, but it's usually being pushed way down by the stuff that it's not at the level of your most recent work um, sure. in the early stages of your career. Same. I mean, this, um, I mean, I know what this is for, for Lawn Square, you know, it's cool, but I would not put this in my portfolio either, you know. Uh, it, what I would do is I, I would take this and say this is a sketch and on top of it I'll have a finished render and registration and that's great because you would show the process you know and people would love that so yeah. I'd say incomplete you know yeah I think I think that's a, a yeah. good warning to people as somebody with you know my own classes in school is that be careful putting homework assignments into portfolios because as professionals we all see those same tutorials you see and we know where they're coming from and what ends up happening is it becomes a question of how much did the instructor paint over, correct, guide, or influence your art. So, mm -hmm. you know, do the class, do the homework, get the feedback from the instructors, but then make sure that you're clearly putting something into your portfolio that you learned from it and not necessarily a homework assignment. I, it, it won't kill you. Like, meaning if you've got a homework assignment that you've done an amazing piece of art on, I'd still love to see that. The question is, is do you want to risk putting that in portfolio and not having that level of personal stuff that David was mentioning before? Like, wh what I really want to see is who you are as the artist. What I want to see is what you love to do and what your influences are because that helps me understand the library of your music, so to speak. Yeah. You know, that, I don't know. I'm not sure. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's one great. more intermediate one, and we're good because I know you're on a tight schedule and you've actually given us more time. Um, so thank you for hanging out and, and going yeah. into depth as much as you have today. Uh, yeah, I don't know which one to pick, to be honest. Uh, maybe this is... Uh... Yeah, this is really good. Uh, I'd say... I say character work, we need some work, you know. Uh, I'd say depth in, I mean, I'd say this image is a little uh, tricky, you know, I would uh, I would work on this one, like in terms of lighting wise, I would redo almost, like I would put those guys into a darker mood. I would put highlights, like the highlight on the guy's jacket is so strong, I would put the same highlight on his head, you know. I would recess back into the atmosphere, so, I mean, it's the same classical stuff, you know, one, two, three, make it a rhythm, you know, where you have foreground, middle ground, background, if you're not sure about the strength of your composition, you know. Yeah, that's Cole, Cole's a great artist, and, and, and this is what becomes a question, too, is if you're an environment artist, um, and I'm not saying Cole is, but if you are an environment artist, how much time should you be spending on characters? If you're a character artist, how much time should you be spending on environments, or how much of that should you show in your portfolio? Um, I think Cole does a lot of book cover illustration, but I'm not sure on that. I might might have him mixed up with someone else. Um, yeah, this is great. You know? uh, the contrast on that gun seems too, too dark compared to the contrast of everything else at the same level. So I would put in the dust a little more. Uh, you know, take care of, of all of your art wherever it is, because what you don't want is somebody coming across your stuff that's seven years old, but I don't want to take the advice away from David right now. David, I think you have an opinion on that. Um, go ahead and share with us that. Yeah, sure. I, I would say that uh, it's like uh, doing spring cleaning. You know? uh, there are times where spring, spring cleaning is, is necessary. You know? Just go ahead. And, Especially, I mean, after five years, you know, you will have progressed so much, especially if you worked hard, you know, that your view on your old work is going to be like, ugh, 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 you know, so <laughs> if you have that feeling on your work, just remove that part, you know, uh, 
don't hesitate. You know? Okay. Uh, so the other question is from Arthur. Hey, no, no problem, Oscar. Uh, yeah, just just go for the vomiting uh, sensation. If it's a vomiting sensation, it's not a good sign. So and I have that too, all the time. Uh, so Arthur is asking, what's your daily warm-up routine? Uh, I wish I had the time to have a warm-up routine. I used to do one speed paint from life every day uh, for many years. Uh, and because of kids, I don't have the luxury. But if you are young, I would say, hell yes. Take your lunch time. Take, now there's no excuse. You have tablets. No. Uh, just go outside you know, or go to a cafe and do some sketches. You know, don't hesitate once you're going to do it. Uh, I wouldn't say warm up, warm usually in the morning. Uh, that's when my brain is kind of, I'm awake still. <laughs> so, so I can go have a strong tea or coffee, you know, jump into my work and then be very efficient uh, those first few hours. And then at lunch to kick you in the balls, you know, you just go at lunch and do like a, a study, life study. A lot of us wouldn't be here if somebody didn't reach back and, and give us some trade secrets. So thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll put these picks up on the forum. Thanks for taking the time to do it. And thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, go to the CGS meetup page on Facebook to keep track of events that are coming up and talk to you all soon. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye, everyone.